Wonderful. How marvelous. Please be seated and help me welcome our speaker for this morning, Reverend Michael Record, who is no stranger, who is a writer, a poet, a lecturer, and just an all-round nice guy. Please help me welcome Reverend Michael. Good morning, good morning, good morning. And thank you, Carol, especially for that last epithet, all-round nice guy. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Friends, again, good morning. Welcome to those worshiping here in the sanctuary in the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living in Kingston, Jamaica. And I greet also those worshiping online via the internet. The breaking news is that it is a perfectly wonderful day. Now, I wrote that on Friday before I started experiencing today. But I knew the statement would be true. Why? Because all the days made by God are perfectly wonderful. And that is whether it is pouring rain, or the sun is shining, or it is snowing, or a fierce hurricane is raging outside, all the days that God has made are perfectly wonderful. But how can that be, you ask? The days I've described are all different, and not just a little different. The conditions are diametrically opposed to one another. If we can call all of them perfect, we have to ask, what does perfect mean? Good question, though I ask it myself. And I'll be answering it in this talk, which is about science of mind's concept of perfection, as well as the ideas of perfection of a number of other people. You see, we do toss around that word perfect a whole lot. A perfect day, I said. A perfect fit. A perfect storm. Perfect health a perfect score, the perfect man, the perfect woman, a perfect egg. And speaking of eggs, anybody knows the joke about the curate's egg? It's a favorite of mine. Every time I hear it, I have to smile. And I'm so happy that I can include it. My favorite joke in my favorite church this morning. That phrase, a curate's egg, originated in a cartoon in the British magazine, Punch, more than a hundred years ago. The title of the cartoon is True Humility. And the cartoon shows a bishop hosting a breakfast for a curate who is a low-level cleric. The bishop looks at the egg that he had just served, the curate, and says, Oh dear, I seem to have given you a bad egg. The cleric replies, Oh no, no, your grace, I assure you, parts of it are perfect. you would probably reject the curate's concept of perfection. 
just as you would reject a whole lot of other people's use of that word, perfect or perfection. The day that you go to the beach would not be perfect if it rained. But the same day might just be what a thousand farmers wanted and would have considered perfect. So we see that perfection, this concept, this idea, is different to different people. And may be different even to the same person on different days and on, on different occasions. You know, if we start thinking deeply about that concept of perfection, we're going to get very philosophical. And in fact, I do want to get philosophical this morning. Man has been, you see, getting philosophical about perfection for thousands of years. So I'm going to take you back partly into the Bible thousands of years ago, and even further back, approximately 2,500 years, to the Greek philosopher, Plato. His thoughts on perfection have been influential all over that period and right up to today. Plato believed that behind every single thing in our world, concrete things and abstract ideas, there is a perfect form, which is the true eternal essence of that thing. In our universe are imperfect copies of those things, imperfect copies of that perfect, ideal form. For example, there are many different horses, big horses and small horses, gray horses and white horses, old horses and young horses, and so forth. And none of the horses that we see is perfect. According to Plato, each horse, horse is an is imperfect, imperfect copy, copy of the of horse, horse form, form, the one, one true horse, horse that an ideal idea, idea of a horse. And the horses that we see are all imitations of that one perfect idea of a horse. I'll give you an example. Like a tree forms a shadow, so is the tree itself, says Plato, a shadow of the one true, perfect form, which is the true tree. And he says that the theory of forms, his theory of forms, applies to physical ob objects as well as concepts like beauty and anger and good and evil. Now, Plato explains that we can't perceive these forms through our senses, hearing, seeing, etc. We need logic and mathematics to truly understand an ideal, perfect form. Through math mathematics, for example, we have discovered the form of the triangle, which is a polygon with three sides. However, we will never be able to truly see with our eyes, physically, such a triangle. Even if we tried to draw a perfect triangle on a whiteboard with a ruler, its lines would never be perfectly straight and two-dimensional. It's imperfect, like the curate's egg. Now, who do we believe is perfect? We believe that God is perfect. But we might admit that it is a belief based on some evidence. Yes, we, we, we have some evidence of God. But we might not say that God is a fact, a truth that we can prove 
scientifically. But I have news for you. The 13th century Italian Roman Catholic priest, St. Thomas Aquinas, had five, no less than five, count them, one, two, three, four, five, scientific arguments proving logically that there is a God, a perfect God. Now, if you ever meet an atheist who wants logical proof of the existence of God, maybe you'd like to try the five proofs of St. Thomas Aquinas. Let's hear three of them. First is the argument of the unmoved mover. This is how the argument runs. In the world, we can see that at least some things are changing. The seasons are changing, the trees are changing, etc. Now, whatever is changing is being changed by something else. If that something else is in itself changed, then it too is being changed by something else. But the chain cannot be infinitely long. So there must be some cause, some thing that is without itself changing, something changeless. What do we understand that changeless thing to be? God. Second proof of St. Thomas Aquinas. We can see around us that things are caused, but it is not possible for something to be the cause of itself, because this would mean that it was prior to its own existence which of course is a contradiction. So, things are caused by something prior to themselves. Now, if that cause is itself caused, it too must have a cause. But again, this chain cannot be infinitely long. So there must be a cause which is not itself caused by anything further. And that first cause we understand to be God. And the third of his five proofs, I hope you have, ex you have accepted the logic of them so far. It seems very logical. The third of the five proofs. I'm just giving you three. In this world, we see that things are possible to be, like the chair, and then, after a while, it's possible not to be. It's quite possible for the chairs that I'm looking at not to be. And eventually, they will not be. In other words, I'm talking about perishable things. But if everything were perishable, if everything was contingent, and thus capable of going out of existence, then obviously there would nothing be existing right now. Things would have, after an infinite amount of time, things would have all gone out of existence. But clearly, things do exist now. We see them. Therefore, there must be something which is imperishable, something that is necessary, and that something we all understand to be God. So there we go. Three of St. Thomas Aquinas's five proofs. You can Google it and look, at, look up his other two. These proofs and his others lead to the conclusion that God exists and is absolutely perfect. They probably sound logical to you. They probably sound sound. 
But I need to, in the interest of fairness, I need to balance them out with the main arguments against the existence of God. That atheist friend of yours might offer this one to you after you have given him three of St. Thomas Aquinas' proofs. He might give you this one. And it is cited by a modern philosopher, Dr. Tom Morris, who is the author of one of my favorite books. I really love it. Author of Philosophy for Dummies. As I say, I, I like that one. His proof is very simple, and the logic is irrefutable. Once you accept the premises on which the conclusion is based, Premise one, if there is a God, there would be no evil in this world. Sounds reasonable. All good, God, there would be no evil. God everywhere, omnipresent, there would be no evil. Premise two, there is evil in the world. We see it. We read about it. The conclusion, therefore, is there is no God. That seems absolutely irrefutable on the face of it. Now, obviously, you can't accept both the arguments of St. Thomas Aquinas for the existence of God and Tom Morris's offering of an argument against the existence of God, though both seem absolutely logical. So you need to think about that quite a bit, I think. But not, not now, not here. I'm speaking. Let us now go to the Bible, and we will see there are some references to perfection. The Bible is full, chock full of references to perfection in the Old and in the New Testament. But I'll focus for now on the New Testament. In Matthew 19, Jesus counsels a rich young ruler who asks, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do to have eternal life? Jesus' initial reply to him is, Why do you call me good? No one is good but the one, that is, God, unquote. Please note that to Jesus too, as to us, God is the only perfect being. Jesus goes on to tell the young man that what he should do if he wants to inherit eternal life, is to keep the commandments. The young man asks, which commandments? Jesus says, I quote, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor, thy father, honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man says to Jesus, All these things I have kept from my youth, what do I still lack? Clearly, the young man, if he has kept all those commandments, is a pretty good fellow. But he thinks there is something lacking, he says. Apparently, he wants perfection. And that is why Jesus answers him, with these words, if you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me, Unquote. But when the young man heard that, he went away sorrowful, for he was very rich. 
In the following few verses after that anecdote, Jesus goes on to tell the audience that it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Just incidentally, the needles are not the needles that we sew with. We're talk they're talking about turnstiles. It's easier for a, for a camel to go through a turnstile than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. What Jesus is saying is that your wealth cannot be more important to you than your spirituality. And clearly, with that young man, his wealth was more important than his desire to enter into, the, into eternal life. In Matthew 5, we read of Jesus telling his disciples how to be perfect. I quote, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you, so that you may become sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just, and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, what do you do more than others? Even the tax collectors do so. Clearly they had something against tax collectors in those days. I wonder if we have anything against tax collectors in these days. Think about that. Therefore, Jesus continues, Therefore, be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Unquote. Here, what Jesus is doing is contrasting how most people treat their enemies and friends. They treat them differently with how God treats everybody equally, giving rain and sunlight to both the good and the bad. Jesus is saying that to be perfect, we must love everybody. We now come to Dr. Holmes and sense of mind and perfection. So far we've been a little philosophical, but you will find that Dr. Holmes is quite practical with his concepts of perfection. We can use these concepts of perfection to our advantage. Now, interestingly, Dr. Holmes, who is a 20th century man, he's the founder of religious science, the philosophy and teaching of this church. Dr. Holmes seems to go back to Plato's theory of spiritual perfect forms existing, as it were, like, like ideal blueprints somewhere. somewhere. And, and his, his idea, idea of objects, objects, objects in the visible universe are merely shadows of those, those ideas. Dr. Holmes writes, when Jesus said to the man, stretch forth thine hand, Jesus undoubtedly saw a perfect hand. Dr. Holmes makes the point that if everything is mental, and if Jesus saw an imperfect hand instead of a perfect one, the so-called miracle would not have resulted. This, Dr. Holmes says, is according to the law of cause and effect. 
Thought is the cause, and the visible universe and conditions and people in our lives is the effect. And this is where Dr. Holmes gets really practical. He's talking about conceptualizing perfection when you are praying for yourself or when you are treating for somebody else. So a spiritual man treatment practitioner does not treat a sick man. He deals only with the idea, a spiritual man. Otherwise, he might enter into the vibration of suffering and might himself experience the result of that vibration. So from what we know, Jesus must have seen only the perfect hand so that the man's hand could become perfect. Now, even though Jesus might have recognized the false condition, as far as his word of healing was concerned, it would have been the recognition of perfection. Otherwise, to repeat, it would not have worked. Dr. Holmes reminds us that healing is not creating a perfect idea or a perfect body. It is revealing an idea which is already perfect. And again, we go back to Plato and his perfect form. Dr. Holmes writes, in consciousness with the infinite, one alone constitutes a majority. So if the practitioner is in tune with God, it really doesn't matter what the rest of the world believes about the apparently sick person. Well, it's a fact that the person might be sick does matter because the practitioner is in tune with God and one with God is a majority. Knowing this in your thoughts, says Dr. Holmes, you should work in perfect peace and calm. And in his textbook, where I got this extract from, he has in capital letters, Always expect the good. Always expect the good. The point being, you get what you expect. Dr. Holmes says, have enthusiasm and above all, have a consciousness of love. A radiant feeling flowing through your consciousness at all times. You, the practitioner, should treat yourself until you have an inner sense of unity with all good and do this regardless of any condition that might appear. In his book, The Science of Mind, in, in the section called The Perfect Universe, Dr. Holmes uses, uses the word perfect several times as he explains how we should think. He points out that the truth is indivisible, indivisible and whole. God is complete and perfect. And we should disregard any evidence to the contrary. The student, the practitioner, conducting treatment, should maintain that he lives in a perfect universe and among people who are potentially, Dr. Holmes uses that word, potentially perfect. If the spiritual universe were not perfect, Dr. Holmes says, it could not exist for a single moment. So we are potentially perfect. It is not true, Dr. Holmes says, it's not true that we have made no mistakes. But if the belief in the necessity of mistakes stays in the consciousness, then there is bound to be more mistakes made. So get rid of that from your consciousness. Because there are no mistakes in the divine plan. If a man, Dr. Holmes gives this example, if a man has apparently lost many opportunities, 
He must be shown that he stands at the point right now, right here, of limitless opportunity. The opportunity is today, now, and the person should see it and grasp that opportunity. For we live in, in a universe of limitless opportunities. A mountaintop is a real thing. But it is not a thing that exists by itself. A wave is a real thing. But it does not exist by itself. A mountaintop is an expression of the larger mountain. A wave is an expression of the larger ocean. Your mind is a real thing, but it does not exist by itself. Your mind is part of the larger one mind, God's mind. And when you think, you use God's mind, the perfect mind. As infinite mind created the universe, so your mind creates your universe. Your universe is part of the infinite universe. Dr. Holmes' message is, we are one, one, only one. And if the universe is perfect and you're part of the universe, you too are potentially perfect. You've got to just start thinking perfection. In praying for yourself or treating for someone else, Dr. Holmes says, Start with this simple proposition. The nature of God, of man, and of being is perfect, harmonious, whole. And in treating, conform your thoughts to this idea. Let the prayer be a treatment, a, a moving thing, a series of thoughts or statements followed by a realization, a growing spiritual atmosphere should come into your consciousness. I'd like us to try that right now. Let us say a series of spiritual statements and see if we feel that spiritual atmosphere surrounding us and being inside of us. I'm going to say these statements. Please repeat after me. God is peace. I am peaceful. God is joy. I am joyful. God is health. I am healthy. God is abundance. I have abundance. And perhaps the most important of the spiritual statements. God is love. I am loving and loved. And just to put icing on the cake of that spiritual atmosphere that I can feel, I want you to say with me this poem which you know very well and will help to engender further that spiritual atmosphere. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my opponents. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord 
forever. Do you feel that spiritual atmosphere? Now, since we live in a universe of cause and effect, and our thought causes our conditions and the events in our lives, what do you think will be the effect of that spiritual atmosphere just created? The effect will be our universe is a mirror of our thoughts. So what will be reflected out of that spiritual atmosphere will manifest in your world. That, folks, is how it works perfectly. Namaste.